in store for us through his word so that we all are encouraged to live our lives for him. And specifically in Matthew chapter number 6, we're going to be looking at verse number 33 specifically tonight. Verse number 33, very well known verse for those who actually know the song. We're not going to sing it tonight, but it's okay. Verse number 33, it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord's blessing on the message. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us this time together. We thank you so much for giving us your word and helping us to know it better and to help us to trust you more. And Father, may you be with our message tonight and may you help us to understand how great you are. And Father, we ask you to help us and to, to really comprehend what we have in front of us tonight, I do pray. All this in Jesus' name. Amen. This verse is a very well-known verse throughout all of the gospel. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, interesting enough, every, every part of Scripture is not in a vacuum. Okay, So it's all surrounded by context. It's all surrounded by other Scriptures. And so we actually went through this entire passage, except for that one last verse in, verse, in chapter number 6, uh, two weeks ago. And so we're going to do a little bit of a review as to what we learned last time that we actually spoke on this. Last week we had uh, the Merrills here, the Merrill Evangelistic team, and so we enjoyed the messages and the, the special musics, but now we're back to our normal schedule. And so what we have in front of us is specifically, notice with me, the last part of verse number 33 says, and all these things shall be added unto you. So the question is for us to think about as we review what we had looked at before, all these things, what does that mean? What things are it specifically mentioning? Now notice back with me. And we're going to be looking at verse number, uh, let's start in verse number 24 to get the context. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the, the, love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, or... Yet your, for your body, what ye shall put on, is not the life more than meat and body more than raiment. And so we see throughout this whole section is that th certain things about it is that what we're not supposed to do is this key phrase of take no thought. Take no thought. What do, what do we say last time that that means? Don't worry. That's right. <laughs> you got a gold star tonight. You know? <laughs> All right. So uh, take no thought. Basically, you can translate a different way of don't worry or don't be anxious. Over and over again, we see in Scripture of take no thought for this, take no thought for that, for various different reasons. We, we can actually see that uh, one verse that I thought I knew what it meant just by reading it through and, and saying, okay, that, that, that is interesting. It says, take no thought for, for the things that you'll say before the magistrates and all that. Um, I thought, oh, yeah, okay, so you don't have to think about it. It's just going to come to you. Well, no, that's not what the verse is talking about because it's the same word. Take no thought. Don't be anxious about it. Not don't premeditate, but rather don't be anxious. Don't be worried about it. got to pray about it. So as we see that, there are three, a uh, couple different things that we see that a person can worry about. We saw that uh, last, uh, last time that we looked at this. We saw that of what we shall eat or that what should we drink or that what should we wear. And so these things people worry about over and over again, uh, but yet 
Jesus says, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. And he gave some wonderful illustrations. He gave illustrations about nature. I love having illustrations of nature. He says, okay, so look at the birds. And he says, okay, the birds don't, uh, they don't do the farming thing. They don't t- toil and they don't do all these different things about uh, what they're trying to get for food. They don't do any of that. They don't plan. They don't do all the things about farming that you have to do in order to plant crops and have a good uh, harvest. No, God gives it to them. In fact, I think, you know, if you think about it, God gave them the instincts and the ability to do to get food. As we talked about last time, this passage does not talk about uh, that we should live our life in a uh, careless way. Somebody says, well, God will supply my needs, therefore I can get in debt, I can do this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, can, I can live because God's going to give it to me anyway. Well, no. <laughs> this passage is talking about good, being a good steward. Being a good steward of what God has given you. And so as we see that, okay, the fowl of the air, they don't uh, sow nor they reap, but God gives it to them. But then also... What, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? We talked about last time about, uh, well, for those who are short, which I am vertically challenged, um, but that's okay. If I'm worrying about it, how can I grow taller? Well, it's impossible. <laughs> by worrying, do you get taller? No. Uh, in fact, in many different commentaries, that verse itself talks about possibly that of worrying about having a long life, and we describe that if you worry, you're going to actually get the opposite, a shorter life, because you'll get some, some of the diseases that only come about a person when they worry all the time. And so if we don't worry, if we trust God, then we don't have to, well, worry about it. <laughs> so we see uh, that these are the things that Jesus is saying that we should not worry about. We shouldn't worry about our food. We shouldn't worry about our drink. We shouldn't worry about uh, our clothes. He talks about the lilies of the field. He says, okay, none of them uh, make their own clothing. None of them make themselves beautiful, but yet God produces the beauty that is beyond that of Solomon himself. Solomon being the greatest and most wealthy king in his time and had all the gold and had all the, the wealth and, and everything to, to ever think about, he had. But yet, even the flowers that today are here and gone tomorrow, Solomon was not, he doesn't look as great as those flowers do. And God did that rather than man did the other. And so we see none of these, all these things shall be added unto you. All the things that we could worry about in life shall be added to us if we get the first part right as to, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That is the most critical point in, I think, the entire Sermon on the Mount. But seek ye first the kingdom of, of God and his righteousness. If you don't get anything else out of the Sermon on the Mount, that one phrase is the key. And so we need to know what that means. We really under, need to understand what that has in store for us. And if we get that first part right, and all these things shall be added unto you. So the direct result, if we get to seek his kingdom, seek his righteousness right, we don't have to worry about the rest. God will supply. So if we get all about God's business, this is a key phrase for tonight, if we get all about God's business, then he will get all about ours. So, all right. So that's what we're looking at tonight. We're going to look at three different stages that a person can have when we're seeking first the kingdom of God. So notice this with me. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. There's no way that you can divorce the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's who God is. The kingdom that will be like God is that of his righteousness. So think about it with me. The first stage specifically is, is specifically 
that we need kingdom accessibility. We need kingdom accessibility. So, first point tonight is that that going into the kingdom is not automatic. Getting into the kingdom of God is not automatic, but rather uh, there is a prerequisite. In fact, you think about all the different verses that comes that came through the Bible about every single person that Jesus says, well, they're not making it into the kingdom of, of God. And I think that of the Pharisees or the, the, the disciples that he, that he has that says, Lord, Lord, shall not enter into the kingdom of God, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. We see that not every single person that believes he is saved is saved. Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. And even more beyond that, they say, and they talk about all the different things that they have achieved. You know, remember when I did this miracle? Remember when I did that miracle? And he shall look at him and say, depart from me, I never knew you. What a sober, sobering comment. Those who think they know Christ, either by their religious affiliation or or they've been baptized before, or they've taken the Lord's Supper, communion, mass, whatever it might be, they possibly would not be saved if they're not regenerate, if they have not come truly to Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior. And so that's one group. Another group is that of uh, a rich man. Jesus says, talking about a rich man, then Jesus said unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Specifically in his era, that the thought about if you are wealthy, you're automatically godly. That was a thought back in the days of Jesus. And you know who the wealthiest people in the land of Judah was? Or Judea? It was the high priest. He was full of filthy lucre. He was filled with all the riches. In fact, those who Jesus tossed out of the temple, they are actually commissioned by the high priest himself. Huh, interesting. So when he says a rich man, how hardly a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, he's speaking against totally the teachings of the Pharisees, the teachings of the Sadducees, and all of the religious leaders of the Jewish people, he's speaking against them. Specifically in the context, he's talking about the young rich man that came and asked, how can, I end, how can I earn my way into heaven, basically? And he said, okay, I'll tell you what. You sell everything you got. Give to the poor. Come and follow me. And he went away sorrowful because he had much possessions. Or rather, his possessions had him, really, if you think about it. So, okay, so automatically a person that is a righteous person, a religious person, he's going to get into the kingdom of God, right? Well, not necessarily. He has to actually receive Christ as his own personal Savior. Oh, okay, well, what, what about those rich men? They must be godly. Well, no, uh, those that have a lot of riches, the riches might have them. But then also we think about uh, those who are not converted that because of their pride. In Matthew chapter 18, verse number 3, and said, Jesus saying, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Entering into the kingdom of God is not automatic. It's not universal. People say, well, you know, he died for everyone, therefore everyone must be saved. No, no. There is a prerequisite. You have to be born again. Jesus says in uh, John chapter number 3, verse number 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's a prerequisite. The very fact that, that God loved us so much that he sent his son into the world so that because of him, we have everlasting life. That is such a wonderful thought beyond every other uh, heroic feature story that we could ever think of. Jesus takes all the glory for himself. He comes to the world and the world, they rejected him. And so because of that, he 
was nailed to a cross. He suffered the wrath of God on the cross for each and every one of us so that when we put our faith on Jesus Christ, He makes us righteous. This thing called justification is a wonderful thing. When I put my faith on Jesus Christ, what happens there is a judicial uh, statement that now my sins, which are many, are on the cross with Christ and He died in my place as a curse for me. And so it says in Romans chapter 3, verse 24 and 25, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Notice this with me. If we think the word propitiation, that's one of my favorite words in all the Bible. Propitiation. Not only is it fun to say, but it has a wonderful meaning behind it. Literally speaking, what propitiation means is that of mercy seat. Everything to do with that of offering a sacrifice is summed up in this word propitiation. You have the sacrifice that was put onto the altar. That's seen in that word. Also, you have the altar itself as part of that word. As well as you see the priest offering it for the sins of the people. So literally, you see the Day of Atonement right there where Jesus Christ offers Himself on the altar and Him offering Himself as the great high priest makes reconciliation and redemption for every single person that puts their faith on Jesus Christ. That's how we get into heaven. That's how we can go into the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. Accessibility. It also has to do with our reconciliation. Reconciliation is basically when two opposing parties are now made peace between them and now they are, well, no longer enemies, but now they are friends. In Romans chapter 5, verse number 9 through 11, it says, Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Love it. We have reconciliation with God. Being justified fully through Christ, God made peace with us. We were His enemies, but now we are friends. Not only friends, but we're adopted into His family. Galatians chapter number 4, verse number 4 through 6, it says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. We're going into the kingdom. We have the accessibility into the kingdom through Jesus Christ. That is the only way that we can, well, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness because no unrighteous person can go into the kingdom and we are made righteous by the blood of Christ. What a wonderful message we have. The gospel of Christ. How a person can be made whole from the sin that they have committed to go before God holy and righteous and just and yet God imputes upon them the righteousness of Christ. What a blessing. So the first stage of seeking the kingdom and his righteousness is specifically having kingdom accessibility through salvation. The second stage is of seeking the kingdom and his righteousness. Number two is for our kingdom compatibility. It's growing in our kingdom compatibility that we become more and more like Christ is really what I'm getting at. In Matthew chapter number 18, verse number 4, it it says, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. If you want to be the greatest in heaven, you got to be humble. What a picture of humility greater than what we have in Christ. 
Philippians chapter number 2 talks about God Himself coming down to the earth. You know, no other religion has God coming down to man, but rather man has to work their way up to God. We have the only system of theology that actually works. God loved us, knew we couldn't redeem ourselves, and came down. And now, we have the opportunity to be like Christ. To have the humility of Christ. To do as Christ would do on the planet earth. What a blessing it is. And the more and more that we submit ourselves to the word of God. More and more that we submit ourselves to the spirit of God. The more and more Christ like we will become. More and more desire that we are going to have for the kingdom of God. To seek it more and more and more. It's called sanctification. Love big words. They're fun. Sanctification. It is me becoming more and more every single day as I submit to the Holy Spirit that I can become more and more like Christ through the Holy Spirit's empowering, through the Holy Spirit's grace that I am now able to do and to be more like Christ. So, Christ loved. He is the epitome of love. Because of Him, because of the Holy Spirit empowering me, I can love like Christ. Now, not perfectly, of course. Uh, we're still in these sinful human tents that one day we'll, we'll take, take off and put on glorious tents, the immoral tents, the perfect tents made like unto the image of Christ, made like unto His, his glorious body, and not like this vile ring that we have here. Praise the Lord. More and more we can be like Christ and more and more we seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Oh, we see this in Romans chapter 14, talking about having the submission to the Spirit. It says, But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for, notice this, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace. And joy in the Holy Ghost. So specifically in context, the, the, the Romans had a, a dilemma. They had one group which are Jewish, the other group were Gentiles. And they had certain factions among themselves. And so Paul is teaching them, okay, don't condemn one another for either partaking of the meat or not. They had an issue with them. So he's talking about, okay, don't judge each other by meats and drinks, but even more so, what is the kingdom of God like? Well, righteousness. Are we righteous in what we do? How about that of peace? Do we have peace that passeth all understanding? How about that of uh, the joy of the Lord? I love the... the I spoke on the fruit of the Spirit uh, once upon a time. Uh, when Pastor Lapina went to Grand Cayman the first time, so this was during the summertime where I was, I was in charge, and so I remember that I was looking forward to preaching on the the, the fruit of the spirit. And when I did joy, oh, I had a I had a a ball preaching on that. It's such an amazing thing, joy, joy, joy. And then so I had the songs that had joy uh, within the title, and so of course I I, I did joy to the world. The Lord has come. And I, I said to him, this is not really Christmas. It's actually second coming. So, but the joy of the Lord. It's an interesting thing. We will know each other by the love we have one for another because of Christ. But there should also be this thing called joy. This thing called joy. Not, not specifically happiness. You know, a lot of times in, in life, it's hard to be happy. Okay. Because if our happiness is based on happenstance, and so circumstances would then dictate whether or not we're feeling happy or not. But rather, joy comes when we understand who God is, when we understand the Bible more, when we understand the end of the story is better than what we have to look forward to. So we praise the Lord. As we submit to the Holy Ghost, these fruits of the Spirit will be 
magnified within our lives. So we need to do that. Uh, also, we should not be like the world. Ephesians chapter 5 demonstrates this. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor an unclean person, no covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. We as Christians need to be different. If we're going to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we need to be like the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, true enough, it's not this holier-than-thou attitude, but rather understanding God's grace, understanding God's mercy, that we do not deserve any good thing that He has given us, but yet God, by His wonderful, amazing grace, gave us all things to be enjoyed and richly blessed us with. And then not only that, but we need to walk worthy uh, according to the kingdom. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. We need kingdom compatibility. And last but not least, the third stage, specifically, the third stage of seeking the kingdom and his righteousness specifically is to develop a kingdom-focused strategy. Develop a kingdom-focused strategy. We know that one day Jesus Christ will come back. That's what he said. I'm taking him at his word, and that is the best thing we could ever do. You know, his word has been proven over and over again with that of history, that of geography, that of archaeology, that of science. Over and over again, the word of God's been proven. Okay, So when he says something, I believe him. And over and over again, it says Jesus is coming back. And we praise the Lord for that. But yet for us, if we're going to seek first the kingdom of God, notice with me, if they're there in Matthew chapter number 6, notice with me verse 33, but don't worry about all these different things that everybody else is worried about, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The word first there has the implication that this should be the greatest thing, the most uh, focused thing that you do in life. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. This should be the number one goal for all of us as Christians, that we are all about the coming kingdom of Christ. And so as we look forward to the coming of the kingdom of Christ on earth, we should develop our kingdom-focused strategy in that we want to see as many people go into the kingdom as possible. So, that's why we are all about missions here. So more and more we dedicate to missions, more and more we pray for missionaries to get to the field so that more people can get saved and to be ushered into the kingdom and his righteousness, the better off we will be. Also that of uh, witness opportunity, being ready for any time that God gives us an opportunity to witness to somebody. Maybe it's through giving a track, maybe it is giving our testimony, maybe it is going through the Romans road, going through the plan of salvation, through the gospel of John, whatever way uh, that God wants you to witness, in that way you should do. And as we think about the things about our life, we need to evaluate things according to the word of God, so that we are doing all that we can do, and that there's no sin in our life that easily besets us or that we struggle with. Getting things out in our life that might be hindering our Christian walk or whatever, whatever is hindering us uh, from walking closer with God that we don't have this, this seeking the kingdom and his righteousness daily. We need to evaluate things concerning that, concerning eternity. And so more and more we do that, more and more we will have rewards in the kingdom of God. Now, I don't understand how it all works out with that of rewards, because there's nothing in me that's good. That's all God working in me, God working through me. But yet he still says, I'm going to give you rewards. Okay. 
So what we need to do is to be so focused on the kingdom that every opportunity we will say, I have made the best of what time I've been given, with what talents I've been given, all these different things. We're going to stand before God one day. Judgment seat of Christ. It's graduation time. We're going home. We're going to the place that Christ built for us as the church of Christ. And we're going to give an account. And may we all do a, have a wonderful uh, testimony before the Lord as to all that he has done in us and through us. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us this night to study your word. And Father, we ask you to help us each and every day to do all that you want us to do. Redeeming the time for the days are evil. We don't know how long we have here on the planet earth, but help us to make most of it. And to help, help people make most of you. We thank you so much for this time that we can pray with each other. May you bless the prayer requests, I do pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.